Oh, good morning, and, and welcome to our, to our worship. The church notices are, are all there as, uh, as printed. Just a reminder that if anyone wishes to donate flowers for the sanctuary for worship, they, they may do so and just uh, put their names on the list or contact the office. And as I said there, we're still with uh, face masks and so on and these regulations, but that's the only, that's the only regulation in fact, and people can now sit where, sit where they wish. So let us worship God. I thought to allow a little bit more congregational participation than we've been having, I'm going to invite you to just seated, we'll say together, we'll just say together the f- words of the first verse of the hymn, and then Val, because you'll see Val is now our organist for the summer, Oliver has departed for uh, for Spain, uh, so thanks, thanks to Val for that. We don't have a soloist either this week or next week, unless someone <laughs> like to volunteer. <laughs> the, 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 there won't be a test. I mean, there won't be an addition. You just if you, if you would like to lead it, then please, please let me know. But for today, we'll we'll begin our worship by saying together the words of the first verse of hymn 160, and then we'll just follow the remaining verses as Val plays the tune. So let us worship God. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, who like me his praise should sing. Praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting King. Blessed be the Lord, whose unfailing love for me was wonderful, writes the psalmist. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. We come together here in this sanctuary, but united with your whole church in this your world. O Lord God, the wonders of your creation, the splendor of the heavens, the beauty of the earth, the richness of nature, all speak to us of your glory. The coming of your Son, the presence of your Spirit, the fellowship and communion of your church reveal to us the marvel of your love. And so we come to worship, to put aside this time, to reflect on your nature, your being, and your ways, 
and all that it is that you ask of each one of us and for the well-being of our own lives and indeed the lives of others and all creation. And yet, O oh God of mercy and God of love, in humbleness of heart, we confess our sin. We forget to love and to serve you and turn from your ways. We are careless of your world, poisoning its oceans, polluting the very air that we breathe. And while we talk of our concern for others, too often we fail to match our words with action. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our gracious God, grant us the assurance of your forgiveness that we might be freed from the faults and the failings of the past. Be with us in every experience of life. When we neglect you, remind us of your presence. When we are frightened, give us courage. When we are tempted, give us power to resist. When we are anxious and worried, give us your peace. And when we become tired and weary in service, give us renewed energy and commitment for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue today with the prophet Jeremiah. I've invited uh, David to read for us this morning. We welcome him back after his surgery in the UK. And uh, looking around, welcome others back as well that we haven't perhaps seen for some time because of all the restrictions of the, of the epidemic. So if you haven't been here for a while, uh, we're delighted to see you back, back with us. Oh, that's better. <laughs> Good morning. Before I start, I have to say I'm really pleased to be back and especially worshipping with everybody again. Hear the word of the Lord, the Old Testament reading from Jeremiah, chapter 29, reading verses four through, uh, 1 to 14, Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Babylon. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and I will fulfill you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me, and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Again, a time of, of music and of reflection.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We continue with the story of, of Jeremiah. Jeremiah and King Jehoiakim lived at a time when the major powers surround, around them were Babylon and Egypt. And Jehoiakim made the unfortunate mistake of switching allegiances, having allied himself with Babylon Following a victory of the Egyptians against the Babylonians, he switched sides and allied himself to the Egyptians. But the Egyptians' victory was short-lived. And very shortly afterwards, Judah and Israel were back under the powers of Babylon. And if not Jeremiah, if not Jehoiakim, then others had to pay a price for the king's switching of allegiances. And that price was that many of the elite of the society were deported and taken into exile by the Babylonians. It's known as the first exile or deportation. It was 597 BC. And of course, it was followed 10 years later by the second exile or deportation, which also saw the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and a much, a much greater number that were exiled and taken off to Babylon. But in this first exile, I say it was the elite, it was the, the nobles, the, the religious authorities, the, the, in a sense, the, those of high status, if you like, that the king allowed to be taken into exile to work in the service of the Babylonian empire. So here they are in Babylon, and it seems that they approach Jeremiah for advice as to how they should live, which in a sense was surprising because they hadn't listened to him for the previous 30 years when he was warning them of their, of their ways and their, of their misdemeanors. But in their present situation, they write to Jeremiah for advice as how they should live in this strange land. And it's a remarkable passage in terms of the expectation that we, that we might have. Because the first thing to realize is that there were others already in exile who were saying this exile is going to be short-lived. Within a year or so, we'll be, we'll be back home. And Jeremiah, if you like, preaches or prophesies against that and says, listen, you're going to be there for three generations. You're going to be there for 70 years. Do not listen to those who say in a couple of years, you'll be back home again in Jerusalem and, and in Judah and life can return to normal. You're in this for the long haul. So given that, what is his advice to them as they live in this not only strange land, but they live in the midst of the, of the, of the enemy? And he offers them these words, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and, and do not decrease. I find it a, a very challenging passage that, remember, they're not just in a strange land, they're living in the midst of the, of the enemy. And I was trying to think of, of sort of comparative illus illustrations. And I thought, first of all, in the, in the Second World War, with occupation of France and the, the Vichy government that was, was set up, the Vichy government allowed parts of France a certain independence and certainly control still over their, over their territories, for example, in in North Africa. Others were involved in resistance. And so you had this quite different response to how to live in this occupied land in the, in the midst of the enemy. You had the Vichy state under General Pétain, and you had the resistance, and ultimately General de Gaulle. What's the advice of, of Jeremiah to his people in this strange land? Is it to join or be part of a resistance? No, he says. Build houses, plant gardens, and live off the produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters, and find wives and, and husbands for your sons and, and sons and daughters. As we know what happened in, in France, eventually, under Vichy, where it was nominally an independent state, it eventually, in 42, became under the con complete control of, of Germany. 
But during that time of, of the Vichy uh, government, they very much followed the policies of the, of the, German, gov the German government, the, uh, the anti-Semitism, the deportation of Jews back to, back to Germany. And it was only as Germany began to lose the war that, in fact, many of the French then began to side more with the, with the resistance and, and with de Gaulle. And, of course, at the end of the war, uh, Pétain was, was arrested, he was tried, he was actually given the death sentence, but it was commuted by de Gaulle to, to, life, to life imprisonment. How do you live in an occupied or strange land? And then I thought maybe a, maybe a better comparison is what happened in Israel-Palestine in 1948 with the Arab-Israeli war. Many of the Palestinians fled at the beginning of that war. Some fled into what was then Transjordan, now the occupied territories of the, of the West Bank. Others fled to neighboring countries, to Syria and, and to Jordan, where there are still refugee camps uh, to this day. But of those that migrated to Jordan, many became integrated into the Jordanian society. They, in a sense, did what Jeremiah suggests to, to his people in exile. Establish yourself there. Be, be part of that society. And they did. And they were very successful. To such an extent that it began to feel a threat to, to Jordanian society. And many of those Palestinians who had been given Jordanian citizenship and played an integral part in the life of, of Jordan have, in more recent years, had that citizenship stripped from them. And others indeed have been deported from the, from the country. So there were a people who tried to live in a new and a strange land, not, not their enemies, but their friends, in a sense, and yet found themselves at the end of the day having their citizenship uh, re removed. It's a, it's a challenging passage. What do you do when you find yourself in a, in a strange land? And then Jeremiah's advice, because you're in it for the long haul, uh, establish yourself there. But then, perhaps even more surprisingly, he says this, because you could, you could imagine them, if you like, quietly getting on with their own lives, trying to, trying to do well, um, not exactly ghettoized, but, but living apart and, and, uh, and doing the best that they can. But he goes on to say this, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you. In other words, it's not just a question of looking after yourselves here. I want you to seek the welfare of the city, Babylon, where I have sent you into, into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And maybe there's a different message in that. It's not just in times of, of exile and refugees, but in terms of how we view immigration and the sort of integration into society. And for those who come as a new country to, to immigrants, the challenge to work, not just for themselves, but work for the welfare of the, of the whole society. For in the welfare of that society or that city, they will find their own, their own welfare uh, does increase. So again, challenging words from, from, from Jeremiah. Remember, seek the welfare of the city to which I have sent you. This is not just a, a different country. This is, the, this is the enemy. This is the enemy that just years later were to devastate Jerusalem and, and Judea and indeed destroy the temple. So strange, strange words from, from Jeremiah. And then to conclude on a slightly, uh, slightly different, different note and from the second part of the, of the passage, I was greatly intrigued uh, this last week to be sent photographs of our grandchildren in, in Canada. Um, our grandson, Ben, who's 11, has just finished elementary school, and our granddaughter, Sophie, has just finished nursery school, from which I thought you just moved on, but apparently not without a graduation. <laughs> I thought graduations were sort of, you know, reserved to when you, you completed your university degree, but no, apparently not. Not even high school, elementary school, and nursery, and so there were these, there were these photographs of them with the, the mortarboard and the gown, <laughs> aged, aged five, aged five. What is there left? I mean, you know, anyway, the point, the point about it is 
this verse here is one that is often used in, at times of graduation and on graduation cards. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. You see why it's kind of appropriate for, for, for graduation, and some of you may have, have received that in your own time. And that's fine. But let's look at it again in the, in the context. This is a people who were anxious, who were felt defeated, who were in exile, who were being forced to work at the service of, a, of another nation, another society, wondering what the future would, would hold for them. And Jeremiah writes these words, his message from, from their God. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Whatever our own personal circumstances, that's perhaps a verse that should, should speak to us. But to speak, speak to us especially in times when we're searching for a, a source of hope, when we are feeling down, when things are, are not going well. It's a message of God's constant love for us in whatever our circumstances. But it's a message to, for those in our world who really find themselves in a very hopeless situation and who are God's concern as much as, as we are. So these two things, at the end of the day, a message of, of hope for people in whatever circumstances, but also a challenge to work for the well-being of of the society in which you live. And there's a message for that in the church, that it's not just about the life of the church, it's about the life of our society and the challenge to work for its well-being. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week, sadly, saw the, the death of one of our very long-standing members, uh, Mary Painter, I um, hope some of you will remember her. She's been out of circulation for, for quite some time um, in a, a rest home up in St. David's. Um, I used to thoroughly enjoy visiting her on a sort of quarterly basis, of course, which has not been possible in these, in these last months. Uh, she had a fall back in February. She's been in hospital since then um, and, and passed away this, this last week. And her funeral service will be here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock uh, for those uh, who perhaps... Uh, remember her from these earlier years. Uh, she did survive to 98 years of age. So let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, we thank you for all your gifts and blessings to us in life. We thank you for our homes, for the different places and societies in which we have lived uh, throughout our lives and for the precious memories of, of these days. Times of families growing up, times of friendships with others, times of community, all these which enrich and enhance our lives. We thank you too for the promise of your presence with us wherever we may be, not contained to one place or to one time, but to all times and wherever we may find ourselves in this, your world the constancy of your everlasting love. We give thanks too for the prophets of old and especially a message of hope. Hope even in the apparent midst of hopelessness. Hopes of a new life, a life of well-being and not of harm. Hopes for a just and stable and peaceful society. And above all, we give thanks for the life and the ministry of Christ and his concern for those who were the rejected and the excluded, his revealing to us of your love for all, but especially the most needy and the most vulnerable. In his name now, we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and for our friends, wherever they may be, and ask for your blessing upon them. For some, a time of change, of moving on. For youngsters, as they move through education onto new challenges, to further study or to employment. We pray for those who have grown elderly 
and are dependent on the care and the support of others. We pray for them and for their carers in this time of need. There are those whom we know are in hospital, others who are recovering from surgery. There are those, sadly, whose illness knows no cure. For them and for their families, we ask the blessing of your peace. There are those who are anxious and worried, concerned in the present circumstances, challenged financially, economically. And there are those who have lost loved ones and for whom this is a time of absence, of bereavement. May they be touched by the comforting and the healing powers of your Holy Spirit. We pray too for those who govern us and for all who are in positions of trust, of power, but placed there in the service of their societies. May they be men and women of honesty and integrity. May they glimpse the vision of your kingdom and its priorities and put them at the heart of their own policies of government. We remember them in our prayers and the difficult tasks that they have and the responsibilities that are theirs. But pray too that we may all each pay our own part in the lives of the societies in which we live and for ourselves the life of this island. We pray too for those whose lives are so very different from our own, those who indeed feel in their present lives a sense of hopelessness, the millions who are refugees, those who have fled from war and civil war and violence, those who seek a new life for themselves and for their children and for their children's children. May they find hope in what is done for them and with them in the ending of such violence and strife. And for those who this day will go hungry through drought or through famine, through the vulnerability of farming, may we work for a fairer sharing of this your world resources. We pray for your church, for the life of this congregation, for your church in the island and your church in the world, that in our lives together and in the communities we seek to build, pe people find a message of, of hope and of reconciliation and care. And always we remember those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive and which so enhanced our own lives. May we not think them far from us, for we share a fellowship a communion with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We offer our prayer of dedication for the gifts that we give to the glory of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate our gifts, our offering, our time, our talents, our money, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's again just say together the, first, the words of the first verse of our closing hymn. Him 192. You can, of course, sing or hum quietly under your masks if you wish to do so, but uh, you do have to keep your masks on. But we'll say together the, first, the words of the first verse of 192. All my hope on God is founded. All my trust he will renew. Safe through change and chance he guides me. Only good and only true. 
God unknown, he alone calls my heart to be his own. Let us stand for the closing benediction and say together the words of go now in peace. Go in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Amen. Go now in peace, never be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith steadfast, strong, and true. No, he will guide you in all you do. Go now in love and show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. God will be there watching from above. Go now in peace, in faith, and in love. Amen. Amen.